the primitive Aryans. Four thousand years ago, that is to say about 2000 BC, Central and Southeastern Europe and Central Asia were probably warmer, moister and better wooded than they are now. In these regions of the earth wandered a group of tribes, mainly of the fair and blue-eyed Nordic race, sufficiently in touch with one another to speak merely variations of one common language from the Rhine to the Caspian Sea. At that time they may not have been a very numerous people and their existence was unsuspected by the Babylonians to whom Hammurabi was giving laws or by the already ancient and cultivated land of Egypt, which was tasting in those days for the first time the bitterness of foreign conquest. These Nordic people were destined to play a very important part indeed in the world's history. They were a people of the parklands and of the forest clearings, they had no horses at first, but they had cattle. When they wandered, they put their tents and other gear on rough ox wagons. When they settled for a time, they may have made huts of wattle and mud. They burned their important dead. They did not bury them ceremoniously as the brunette peoples did. They put the ashes of their greater leaders in urns, and then made a great circular mound about them. Those mounds are the round barrows that occur all over North Europe. The brunette people, their predecessors, did not burn their dead, but buried them in a sitting position in elongated mounds, the long barrows. The Aryans raised crops of wheat, ploughing with oxen, but they did not settle down by their crops. They would reap and move on. They had bronze and some when, about 1500 BC, they acquired iron. They may have been the discoverers of iron smelting. And some when, vaguely about that time, they also got the horse, which to begin with they used only for draught purposes. Their social life did not center upon a temple like that of the more settled people round the Mediterranean, and their chief men were leaders rather than priests. They had an aristocratic social order rather than a divine and regal order. From a very early stage they distinguished certain families as leaderly and noble. They were a very vocal people. They enlivened their wandering by feasts, at which there was much drunkenness, and at which a special sort of man, the bards, would sign and recite. They had no writing, until they had come into contact with civilization, and the memories of these bards were the living literature. This use of recited language as an entertainment did much to make it a fine and beautiful instrument of expression, and to that, no doubt, the consequent predominance of the languages derived from Aryan is, in part, to be ascribed. Every Aryan people had its legendary history, crystallized in bardic recitations, epics, sagas and vidas, as they were variously called. The social life of these people centered about the households of their leading men. The hall of the chief, where they settled for a time, was often a very capacious timber building. There were no doubt huts for herds and outlying farm buildings, but with most of the Aryan peoples this hall was the general center. Everyone went there to feast and hear the bards and take part in games and discussions. Cowsheds and stabling surrounded it. The chief and his wife and so forth would sleep on a dais or in an upper gallery. The commoner sort slept about anywhere, as people still do in Indian households. Except for weapons, ornaments, tools and such like personal possessions, 
there was a sort of patriarchal communism in the tribe. The chief owned the cattle and grazing lands in the common interest. Forests and rivers were the wild. This was the fashion of the people who were increasing and multiplying over the great spaces of Central Europe and West Central Asia during the growth of the great civilization of Mesopotamia and Denial, and whom we find pressing upon the Heliolithic peoples everywhere in the second millennium before Christ. They were coming into France and Britain and into Spain. They pushed westward in two waves. The first of these people, who reached Britain and Ireland, were armed with bronze weapons. They exterminated or subjugated the people who had made the great stone monuments of Karnak in Brittany and Stonehenge and Avebury in England. They reached Ireland. They are called the Goidelic Celts. The second wave of a closely kindred people, perhaps intermixed with other racial elements, brought iron with it into Great Britain, and is known as the wave of Britonic Celts. From them the Welsh derive their language. Kindred Celtic peoples were pressing southward into Spain and coming into contact not only with the Heliolithic Basque people, who still occupied the country, but with the Semitic Phoenician colonies of the seacoast. A closely allied series of tribes, the Italians, were making their way down the still wild and wooded Italian peninsula. They did not always conquer. In the 8th century BC, Rome appears in history, a trading town on the Tiber, inhabited by the Aryan Latins, but under the rule of Etruscan nobles and kings. At the other extremity of the Aryan range, there was a similar progress southward of similar tribes. Aryan peoples speaking Sanskrit had come down through the western passes into North India long before 1000 BC. There they came into contact with a primordial brunette civilization, the Dravidian civilization, and learned much from it. Other Aryan tribes seem to have spread over the mountain masses of Central Asia, far to the east of the present range of such peoples. In eastern Turkestan there are still fair, blue-eyed Nordic tribes, but now they speak Mongolian tongues. Between the Black and Caspian Seas, the ancient Hittites had been submerged and Aryanized by the Armenians before 1000 BC, and the Assyrians and Babylonians were already aware of a new and formidable fighting barbarism on the northeastern frontiers, a group of tribes amidst which the Scythians, the Medes and the Persians remain as outstanding names. But it was through the Balkan Peninsula that Aryan tribes made their first heavy thrust into the heart of the Old World civilization. They were already coming southward and crossing into Asia Minor many centuries before 1000 BC. First came a group of tribes, of whom the Phrygians were the most conspicuous, and then, in succession, the Aeolic, the Ionic and the Dorian Greeks. By 1000 BC they had wiped out the ancient Aegean civilization both in the mainland of Greece and in most of the Greek islands. The cities of Mycenae and Tyrins were obliterated and Knossos was nearly forgotten. The Greeks had taken to the sea before 1000 BC they had settled in Creek and Rhodes, and they were founding colonies in Sicily and the south of Italy, after the fashion of the Phoenician trading cities that were dotted along the Mediterranean coasts. So it was, while Tiglas Pileser III and Sargon II and Sardanapalus 
were ruling in Assyria and fighting with Babylonia and Syria and Egypt, the Aryan peoples were learning the methods of civilization and making it over for their own purposes in Italy and Greece and North Persia. The theme of history from the 9th century BC and onward for six centuries is the story of how these Aryan peoples grew to power and enterprise and how at last they subjugated the whole ancient world, Semitic, Aegean and Egyptian alike. In form, the Aryan peoples were altogether victorious, but the struggle of Aryan, Semitic and Egyptian ideas and methods was continued long after the Scipitra was in Aryan hands. It is indeed a struggle that goes on through all the rest of history and still in a manner continues to this day.